Hello everyone, I've recently been playing around with different procedural animation techniques, and while I've been happy with the results, I've been looking for ways to get more fluid looking animations. Today, I want to share a technique that uses soft body physics. I'll be walking you through the steps of simulating a soft body, and by the end of the video, you'll know how to transform it into a procedurally animated character. First, we need to discuss some basic physics. Let's consider a single point. For our starting parameters, we know the current position of this point, and let's also assume it has some velocity toward the right and is accelerating downwards due to gravity. To find where the point goes in the next time step, we can add the velocity to the position and the acceleration to the velocity. This is Euler's method of solving the equations of motion, and it produces a convincing, though slightly inaccurate approximation of motion. It seems we've lost our point, so let's just rewind time and handle collisions properly. Whenever the point hits the ground, we'll flip the velocity in the y-axis, and when it hits the sides, we'll flip the velocity in the x-axis. Finally, to prevent the point from bouncing around forever, we'll dampen the velocity by 1% each time step. Now, we have a nice bouncing ball simulation that we can even add multiple points to. However, to get more interesting behavior, we need to allow the points to interact with each other. For example, let's take two of these points and connect them together with a distance constraint. Whenever these points are too far apart or too close to each other, they should be moved back to the correct distance. So how do we do that? Well, if we can find the midpoint of our connection, we just need to project half of our desired distance in either direction, and that's where our points should go. We can find this midpoint by taking the average of our two points, then, to find the vectors for the projection, we can subtract one point from the other. This produces a vector between the two points. Next, we'll normalize the vector. Most vector libraries will have a method to do this, but you can also compute it manually by using the Pythagorean formula to get the distance between the points, and then dividing the vector by that distance. Next, we'll multiply our normalized vector by half of our desired distance to get the projection we need. We just add this vector to the midpoint to get one of our desired positions, and subtract it to get the other desired position. Now that we have our distance constraint formula, let's see what happens when we run our physics simulation. Well, it seems we've broken physics. The problem is that we're not considering the motion of the constraints in our physics rules. Specifically, whenever the points are pulled by their constraints, it should also affect their velocity. Let's make some modifications to our position and velocity functions. First, we can swap the velocity term in the position function to use the updated velocity term instead. This is called the semi-implicit Euler method and is slightly better than what we had before. It also allows us to simplify our equations. But we're not done here. Let's take a closer look at our position function. If we rearrange the terms, we find that the velocity is equal to the change in position over time, which makes sense. And that also means we can rewrite our function without any velocity term at all by substituting this new formula for velocity. And this is actually called Verlet integration. Also, since we're using positions to compute velocity, the change in position caused by our distance constraints should be incorporated into the physics system now. Perfect. Now that our distance constraints are working, we can create more complex structures, such as this blob. And by the way, when a point has multiple distance constraints, it will be pulled in conflicting directions, so for each point, I'm actually averaging together the effects of all of its constraints. Anyways, going back to the blob, while it looks kind of like a soft body, it's just way too floppy, kind of like a deflated ball. To fix this, we want to preserve a constant area inside of this blob, which we can do by dilating it. Or in other words, expanding it when it's too small and shrinking it when it's too big. But how do we even find the area of this blob? Well, we can use the trapezoid formula. Let me show you how it works. Using this random shape, we're going to start from the point at the top left and loop clockwise around the shape. For each point, we'll take the line segment formed with the next point 
and connect it to the x-axis with vertical lines. This creates a trapezoid, and we can find the area of this trapezoid by subtracting the x-coordinates to get the width, and then average the two y-coordinates to get the average length. We multiply width by length, and that's the area of the trapezoid. We'll keep going through each point, forming new trapezoids, and adding their area to the total. Now, you may have noticed that we have also been including the area outside of our shape, and here's how we fix that. Whenever the x-coordinate of the next point is smaller than the current point, we'll actually get a negative value for the width, and as a result, we'll subtract the area of this trapezoid. This cuts out the extra area that we added before. At the very end, you can see that we have covered the full area of our shape. So, with the trapezoid formula, we can find the area of any irregular polygon, including our blob, and after computing the area of the blob, we'll subtract it from the desired area and then multiply by a scaling coefficient. Both the desired area and the scaling coefficient are arbitrary values that we can configure later. Anyways, this equation gives us our scaling factor. We will scale our points with this factor by first looping through them in a clockwise direction. For each point, if we take the two points on either side and subtract them from each other, we'll get a vector that represents a secant line on the blob. We can rotate this vector by 90 degrees counterclockwise to get a normal line. We'll perform this rotation by negating the y-coordinate and then swapping the x and y-coordinates. Now we can normalize this vector multiply it by our scaling factor, and add it to the point. This shows the desired location for the point. And note that we'll be averaging this dilation effect with all other distance constraints on the point. If we repeat this process for all other points on the blob, we'll have successfully completed the dilation algorithm. Running the simulation again, the blob looks much more like a soft body, though it's a bit too squishy. This is because our distance constraints and dilation take a while to converge to the correct solution due to all of the averaging. To fix this, we will run the constraints and dilation about 10 times per time step to converge more quickly. Now we have a much more reasonable softbody, specifically a volume preserving softbody. Now, for the fun part, we can do a bit of art to turn this soft body into a character. First things first, I want to do something about the jagged lines on this soft body. The graphics library that I'm using, Processing, provides access to a type of curve called a catmull rom spline. I won't be discussing the math behind splines in this video, but I've linked some great videos on the topic in the description below. And after switching to splines, the soft body is looking much softer. Alright, so my idea for this character is something loosely inspired by a frog, or maybe a toad. I'm going to color the body green, and then start creating the face of the character. I'm mostly relying on the 2D shapes provided by my graphics library, but this could also be done with any kind of sprite or image. After the face is done, it needs to be attached to the soft body. We'll do this by centering the face relative to the topmost point of the body, and we'll also rotate the face in the same direction as the topmost point's normal vector, which we can find with the same secant trick from earlier. Here's how it looks with the physics simulation. Next, I want to add legs using a different kind of distance constraint. In my previous procedural animation video, I showed this procedure where we constrain points by finding the vector between them with subtraction, then normalize and multiply by the desired distance. Doing this for multiple points and combining it with the Verlet integration that I shared at the start of the video, we can make a chain that hangs down from the first point. If we want to use this chain as a leg, we need to make some minor changes. First of all, legs do not have a 360 degree range of motion, so we need to restrict the possible angles between each point. We can define an upper and lower bound for the rotation, and when these bounds are exceeded, we'll constrain the angle back in bounds. The vector library I'm using makes this pretty easy to do, 
but if you need to manually rotate the vector to a given angle, this formula will give you a unit vector in any direction. Just remember to multiply by the original vector's magnitude. After playing around with some rotation settings, I ended up with these legs, and I'm once again using some splines to draw their outlines. To attach them to the body, we can center them on different points of the outline. We can use these two points to attach the back legs behind the body with a slight offset toward the center, and then these two points to attach the front legs. If we draw a line between them, we can place the legs roughly halfway between the center and the edges. And with that, we have completely finished this procedurally animated frog character. It's admittedly not very realistic, especially the limbs, which still look a little uncanny to me, even with the angle constraints, but I do like how the character is squishy and deformable. Anyways, that's all for this video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.